Matthew, Katie, 7.6. Uh, let's talk some tech with Matthew Dixon. Hello. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk some tech. Got to love talking tech. Yes, yes, we do. Now, road trips, you know, can they help uh, power an electric car? Well, it might be a really good tactic, I think. In some regional areas, we know the roads aren't so great. And maybe this is a way we can try and get them to improve the roads. The first solar road has now been built in the US. It's in Georgia. And basically, they've taken a section of road. They've relayed it with solar panels, obviously not the normal solar panels you have on the roof of your house. They're designed to be on a roadway. They've been tested throughout Europe. And this is the first time they've been installed in America. At the moment, this particular city called Peachtree Corners, I've never heard of it, but that little city is putting all the power that's being used or generated from that road into electric vehicle charging stations. But this is just step one. They've got plans, if this is successful, and I don't see why it won't be, to build more footpaths, or as they like to call them, sidewalks uh, with solar panels, build more roads with solar panels, put that back into street lighting, for example, charging batteries to, to run various utilities, and of course have those electric vehicle charging stations. So great idea, because when you think about it, you've got a big flat surface, it's exposed to the sun most of the time. Sure, every now and again there's a, a car that goes over it, but unless you've got a really congested road, it's, it's exposed to the sun most of the time. That little car that goes on it doesn't really cover up much shade in terms of the reduction in solar generation. So good idea, and I can see this being rolled out more and more across America, and eventually one day when Australian governments get the hang of this whole solar and EV stuff, they might actually start rolling them out over here. I wouldn't go holding my breath to get around here, Matt, because if it's taken them 70 years to sit there and go, oh, we forgot to build the train line and 160 years to build a bridge over the road, I'm not holding my breath. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing you. Maybe this is a way, though. Maybe we could say, hey, we need some extra roads around this region. Why don't you build them out of solar panels? And they might think they're yeah. more progressive then. Yeah, I, I know, there's been a ditch in our road that uh, council have had for the last three weeks. So maybe they could start there. I don't know. Can we lay some solar panels in there? Because uh, by, by the end of me driving up and down my street, uh, I'm going to need a new car by the end of it. So uh, uh, look up in the sky. It's a better supply. No, it's the internet. The internet up in the air. How cool is that? I mean, there's Loon, you may have heard of Loon, L-O-O-N. It's a subsidiary of, of Google or, or Alphabet, as the company's now known. And they've been putting balloons up into the stratosphere to give internet access to some remote areas. So they're up around 20 kilometres, even up as high as 50 kilometres above the Earth, which sounds like a long way, but in terms of remote connectivity, that's, that's quite a reasonable distance. You don't get too much latency at that distance. But the real challenge is... You can only put so many helium tanks up in the balloon, they put them up in the sky, and eventually they come back down. So you need to have a few of them up there at the same time to give you that overall coverage with the internet. But they've been working on some AI lately, so rather than a human being the pilot for these on the ground, powering where they go, they've been using AI. And they've slowly been getting more and more days out of them up in the air. They start off with 20 days, 30 days, 100 days, couple hundred days. But AI pilots are now at the point where they've been able to keep these up in the air for 312 days, so not far off a whole year. So quite incredible. Launch the balloon, put a few helium tanks in there, give internet access to a fairly wide area because you've got them up, as say, around that 20 kilometre mark, and then you've got internet access for places like already they're, they're giving internet to Kenya, Mozambique, Peru, some places that are pretty harsh areas, obviously very hilly areas. This makes it a pretty good solution for those areas and some areas that don't have great infrastructure on the ground. So great idea in the first place, but the combination of AI with these balloons is being able to keep them up in the air a lot longer. Yeah, it's a fantastic premise. Uh, maybe they can bring some out here to uh, some parts of the Midwestern region that still can't get some decent stuff like MPN service. And that's the problem where we are, the solution by the Australian government, and we're not a, we're not a third world country, we're not a Mozambique, for example, but mm. the solution by the Australian government with the NBN has been geostationary satellites, and I'm sure you know the number, Andrew, 35,786 kilometres above the Earth is where geostationary satellites sit, and that introduces a huge amount of latency and a little bit of unreliability as well. Bring that down to 20 or 50 kilometres up, you can see the huge advantage that would give you. But again, probably some way away before we get things like that over here.
Yeah, because everyone wants to watch The Crown in HD on Netflix, Matt. Have you seen The Queen's Gambit yet? (laughs) Well, that's fair enough. And The Queen's Gambit, good example. That's the number one short series Netflix show of all time. And it's actually generating a whole bunch of interest in chess, in particular chess by girls. You know, I know. I know, right? Queen to Bishop 4, I say. Uh, kids, we all know uh, Santa is right around the corner. Have you got your list together uh, yet, Matt? Oh, look, my list is always tech, tech, and more tech. Whatever new tech's there, oh. I'll have it. Thanks very much. Boring. You could at least put a DVD or something in there. <laughs> yeah, DVD. <laughs> What's DVD? Does that still exist? Is that? Uh, oh, you're one of these streaming anymore? people. <laughs> oh, you're one of these mega streaming people. I forgot. I got me- I got gigabit, megabit in my house. I can just watch anything I want. Well, we actually just unplugged our DVD player a couple months ago while we cleaning up the land. Oh. And my wife said, do we need this anymore? And I went, the last time we used it was, yep, let's get rid of it. So it's, on, yeah. it's, it's, it's one of those things now that anything you want, just go and find it somewhere on the net. Yeah, find it online. There you go. Well, you can even find Santa online now. Yeah, there's so many. And this has probably been driven out of the US. So many places still in lockdown in the US that, Places that have had Santa in their shopping malls, in their shops, uh, Macy's, for example, they've had Santa for 160 years. You can go and see Santa there. This year, for the first time ever for some of those places, they haven't had a real live Santa there. So that does a couple of things. The kids are pretty disappointed, but the Santas who made money out of that, that used to be their income stream towards the end of the year, then uh, they've got no income coming in until someone came up with the bright idea of having Zoom Santa. And I can't believe how much people are paying for this. People are paying, say, $50 for five minutes with Santa in a virtual environment. You can have five minutes, you can have 10 minutes with Santa. The the Santas that are doing it are actually finding this is an increase for their income because in the past they've sat in a shopping mall, sometimes just during the busy period, a few hours in the middle of the day, and, and that's it, they have to go back home. Now they're doing Zoom Santa calls maybe nine hours a day. So picking up 50 bucks for every five minutes over a nine hour period, you can see they start to generate some pretty decent income from being Santa Claus. Uh, the kids love it as well. They can sit there and talk to Santa. The, the Santas get a bit of a list from the parents beforehand so they know what to talk about with the kids. So the kids are pretty excited about it and Santa's there in that virtual environment. Plus, they get the feeling that they really are sitting there in their home, sitting there mm. at the North Pole while they're chained to the kids. So, you know, Santa's very busy and he needs all these other Santas to help him, Matt. It's a very expensive exercise, this Santa game. It is an expensive exercise. So good on the Santas for being innovative and coming up with a different solution. Yeah, absolutely. Now, up until now, you've needed an iPhone to use an Apple Watch, right? Yeah, that's right. But that's just changed. And there's two groups of people that uh, probably opened this sort of idea very young people and very old people. Some parents are probably parents in both scenarios, one being looking after their own parents or one being a parent to young children. Some parents with their young kids, they don't want to give them a smartphone, they don't want to give them an iPhone in particular, but they still want them to go and play sport or be picked up from dancing or be able to just ride their push bike around with their friends but still feel comfort that they can get in contact with them or see where they are. So now you've got a thing called family setup and you can actually have your iPhone and set up an Apple Watch that's not set up with all your settings and all your information can be a separate setup. You give an Apple Watch to one of your kids, you can still call them. They're not exposed to all the perils of social media, but you can be in contact with them and see where they are. And the same for some elderly people, elderly people that may not have a smartphone, or you may be worried about, for example, your parent or your grandparents that might have a fall and might need to have some emergency services be able to come and help them and and the the Apple Watch can help do that or even just stay in contact with them without the complication of a smartphone. So great idea from Apple. When they first brought out the Apple Watch, this was never on the drawing board, but with feedback from people around the world, they've said, we think there's a market there for this. So people are now able to buy an Apple Watch as of the last couple of days and set it up separately to their own individual iPhone. Yeah, that's a very cool idea because I I know... I know we have an elderly gentleman who lives across the road from us and uh, he struggles with technology and he lives on his own now. And to be able to use something very simple and not have to muck around with it and all that, I think it's a fantastic thing. Yeah, and it certainly gives an alternative solution for, for example, the emergency pendants that some older people have. But the great thing Mm. about an Apple Watch is if you fall over, 
and the watch experiences a certain number of Gs, and then you don't move for a minute after that, it will automatically call emergency services for you. So little things like that where as a child with elderly parents, you can have a fair bit of peace of mind that things are going to go okay for them. Yeah, there you go. Uh, parents, grandparents, uh, what are you asking for this Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, finally, what is a me, not a me? Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting. The lesson here, I think, is whatever goes on the internet is there forever. There's a, a gentleman who's actually a, a doctor. Of, he's got a PhD in entomology, so he's, he's involved in some research and probably some COVID-19 research. And he was shocked to find that a photo of himself as an eight-year-old had suddenly become an internet meme. And so you can imagine the shock. And, and, and I had a look at the picture. He wasn't a very attractive eight-year-old. He had big buck teeth. He had a, he had a haircut Come from on. the 70s. He was, he was doing the rounds as this meme. And, and I suppose he thought, well, I could get really mad about it or I could embrace it. And he ended up contacting the person who created the meme. And he, he felt quite comfortable that this person wasn't creating it in a mean spirit. But he just thought it was a funny picture of a kid and, and made it a meme. And, and away it's gone around the world. And so... That's, I suppose, the lesson that, that he's had from this and the lesson he's tried to talk to his kids about, because you can imagine when you find out that your dad is an internet meme, uh, but the, the lesson that he was trying to, to push out there was basically whatever you do, whatever photo, whatever video, whatever you think is okay at the moment, just think about how it might be in 5, 10, 20 years' time and whether you're still comfortable with that. And so be careful what goes on the internet because it might go around and around the internet and come back and bite you. Yeah, because you don't want to have that conversation that starts with, well, it was the 70s and the 80s and it was different times, but I think you're being a bit harsh on him calling him not very attractive. <laughs> you have a look at the photo. <laughs> I think he admits himself that it maybe wasn't the most attractive photo of himself. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that it's just that classic little kid shot and uh, it's just gone around for whatever reason. Someone's picked it and used it and away it's gone. I'm just grateful my mum never uploaded that uh, photo of me where I'm in the laundry tub, butt naked, crying when I'm just trying to bath myself. No, hang on, that was last Tuesday. I was going to say, that was only a few weeks ago I heard. 